low 60s. Sunny again tomorrow, except for some late. <coughs> well, welcome, everybody, to the City of Moscow Public Works and Finance Committee meeting of June 8, 2015. Uh, very first item on the agenda is approval of the May 11, 2015 minutes. They look good to me. I would agree that they are approvable. Okay. Well, then uh, we will show on the record that the minutes have been approved. And it uh, looks like we got Don instead of Cassie, but uh, we have the disbursement report for May 2015. Yes. So the disbursements report for the month of um, May is one million nine hundred ninety-seven thousand nine hundred eighty-five dollars and three cents, and that consists of three payrolls. And hang on, I just had my no, no, I'm doing it by the fly because I don't have my sheet, and um, there's. Do you have a cover sheet? I happen to be in Gary's office. Yeah, give that to Dawn. No, not that. No, no. One. Here. Oh. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I do. Thanks. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thought I had it in this uh, pile. Okay, so 94% uh, of the expenditures are characterized by the following categories. Payroll one million two hundred ninety-three thousand thirty-three dollars, which is three payrolls. We have. Uh, Two months during the 12 month process where we have three payrolls in a time frame because there's 26 pay periods. Could be, and we pay every other week. Professional services, $99,974. That consists of about $37,000 on booster station work, uh, downtown restroom, uh, $5,881, uh, Otnes Park landscaping, and then uh, U of I A Street work at $18,408. Um, Sanitation, $253,450. Contractual payments, $24,153. Supplies, $20,705. Construction, $9,147, which is some sidewalk, sidewalk work and, and the new moose. It isn't there yet, I guess. The moose is there. It is? Mm -hmm. The moose is in and, oh. and routed in. Okay, cool. I didn't know that. I was told different just a few minutes ago. Utilities, $75,620. Equipment, $49,788, which is mostly all computer equipment. Improvements, $14,448. And insurance, $17,148. Those categories total $1,857,466, which is 94% for the month of May. And if you have any questions. It's really uh, pretty um, for the seasonality is a uh, light year. There's only about $700,000 in commodities. The reason it goes up to $2 million is the three payrolls. So that's a side note. Curiosity, how many bucks do we have three payrolls? <clears throat> two. Just two. That's what I remembered. Art, did you have any questions for Don? No, I do not. I was glad you said three pay periods. Yeah. 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 That kind yeah. of jumps out at mm -hmm. you, doesn't it? Get it off for you. Oh, There's a blue pen though, right there. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Don. Next item is the 8 to 18 inch cured in place pipe rehab. Uh, the bid results. Contract award, Scott Bondrager. Hi, Scott. Good afternoon. So we're back with this project again. When uh, we first brought this to you back in March, or back last April, this project consisted of uh, multiple diameters of pipe, including a six inch diameter, which at the time we found to be not the most cost-effective means to do this uh, trenchless technology. So with this latest project, we took the six-inch diameter pipe out and basically put out the same quantities that we had last time. And the bid results this time came in a lot more favorable. 
We received uh, two bids again from the two pre-qualified bidders that we had, in situate form technology and plan and engineering construction. In situate technology, or in, in situ form, came back with a bid of 293892 and Plan and Engineering Construction Incorporated came back with a bid of 225000 with the engineer's estimate at 253682 Say so we got pretty good bid from the Plan and Engineering Construction for this project. So for this, looks like we're uh, <clears throat> basically recommended uh, contract bid and award of the 225000 to uh, plan and engineering, <clears throat> engineering construction for this particular project, which I believe we got pretty good bids on because they're the ones that are doing the work up in Coeur d'Alene. Okay. Walter. <clears throat> um, your two bidders, Scott, were from Missouri and Montana. Mm -hmm. Is there no one closer that does this kind of work? No, it's pretty specialized type of work. And when we were doing the pre-screening, we had sent it out to pretty much anyone out there who wanted to pre-qualify to be able to bid on this type of work. This type of work, I mean, there are lots of contractors throughout the country, but these were the few of the ones that had responded and the ones that would actually, you know, fit our criteria for doing this type of work. It's about 4,500 on your feet. Mm -hmm. Have we figured out what to do about the six inches? The six inch we'll have to continue investigate if we're going to have to go the direction of doing the, the typical dig out and replace. Or there might be some other technology out there too. We're still looking into that. But we've got plenty of pipe that's greater than six inch diameter to keep doing. This is kind of our, uh, you know, test it out type year for this stuff. But this is something that Coeur d'Alene does every year. Okay. Very briefly, how, how does this physically work? How do they do it? Do they pull a, pull a pig through it or, or heat it? What, what's the, yeah, it's, it's what's essentially the, uh, resin you fight. You don't have to dig up the whole street. No, no. This is basically a pipe inside of a pipe. You take and you put a uh, resin fiber sock, per se, that's inverted, pulled through the pipe from one manhole to the other. And then once it's in place, it's uh, steam cured or some other type. It depends on the technology or, you know, the company of which one they use. But essentially, you're curing a pipe inside the existing pipe. And once it's cured, it's essentially a standalone pipe. But it's pulled through the existing stuff, so you don't actually have to dig anything up. And how do they cut in the services? They come back with a robot that comes through and actually has attachments for doing that type of work. And that was the problem with the six inch working inside such a small pipe. Yeah. Okay. A lot of risk involved with that small of a pipe. What's what's the robot doing inside? It's it's cutting in the, the lateral service that's coming from the house. Yeah. That connects to it. So it's cutting out and then reconnecting that service. Huh. How much smaller is the pipe? If we start off we had an eight inch pipe, now we're putting a pipe in it and curing it, how much smaller does it get? Not very. I mean it's pretty minimal. Pretty small. Yeah. I mean, your typical pipe thickness for that diameter is maybe three-eighths to a half-inch, depending on the material. Okay. I'm good. Okay, we're good. We're good. Let's fix the sewers. We'll send it on to council. We'll just put on the consent agenda and move forward. Thank you. Les McDonald is presenting its request for beer and wine garden. For butchers. Yeah, just, and just before we jump into that, just to follow up on that last question mm. about pipe size, uh, one of the things to keep in mind is we're often replacing or lining either clay or old concrete pipe when we're doing this type. And the change in the pipe material is such that we get better hydraulics for the materials, less friction sure. on that type of pipe. And so even though the pipe diameter is a little bit smaller, Slicker. The, it's slicker, yeah. right? And so you you don't generally lose much capacity, if any. Sometimes you actually gain some capacity, just because of better hydraulics of that different material. So yeah, this is and this is preferable to pipe bursting. 
It's just another technique. Uh, pipe bursting, you know, can have other disruptions because of the, the change. You know, pipe bursting, you're pulling something through and, and you're having a physical change in diameter. Um, and so you can, in some cases, cause problems with that. It's another alternative. It's good in many situations, just different techniques. You do pipe bursting with a six inch here. We're, we're still back on the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I haven't quite left it, but uh, yeah, that is an option. Um, and you know, sometimes you actually want to increase pipe size when you pipe burst. I mean, there's different options for that, but it's one of the tools. Sure. Yeah, so. Okay. Okay. So for this agenda item, this is a request from uh, Pat Greenfield of Boosters to allow her to do a. Um, Beer and wine garden uh, in the city right away. This is similar to a request you processed here in the last month. Uh, the first one was supposed to occur, uh, I think it was in the end of May, early June, and they uh, were rained out. Uh, and so this would be the. Never occurred. Never occurred. And so this is the second attempt. Uh, this one will be occurring uh, later this month on June 26th from 6 p.m. to 11 is the request and uh, as you'll recall the process here is such that the council um, recently made some changes in our code that allow for certain types of events to serve uh, beer and wine within public right-of-way under certain conditions and as approved by the council so what's in your packet here today then is a alcohol use application form uh, within that, there's this map that shows what the event's going to look like. So there will be a, a stage uh, out there in the intersection of, of Second and Main, uh, and then a beer and wine garden actually on Main Street, uh, kind of in that diagonal parking closest to Bootsers um, on the west side of the street uh, and slightly north. So those who, the location is overall is the same as it was in the previous application. They just modified the stage and the, the garden location slightly um, for overall circulation and, and access improvements. As part of uh, that process, uh, they are required to submit a hold harmless agreement. A copy of that is in your packet as well. So assuming that this moves forward with the council authorization, then they would have to complete this document to hold the city harmless from uh, things that might happen within the event. Okay. They also have to provide a level of insurance, and there's a copy of the Certificate of Liability Insurance in your packet. It's already in our hands uh, for this event. Names the city as an additional insured. Uh, and again, in the event that anything does occur uh, during this event on city right-of-way. And then the other item uh, and where the council would ultimately need to take action is the resolution. And you saw one of these previously. Uh, we do need to do one of these for each event as it comes along so that the council grants authority via resolution and that draft resolution is also in your packet here so again very similar uh, essentially the same um, as a previous request just a different date uh, council or excuse me the staff uh, does is not providing a recommendation on this but if the council decides to proceed uh, we would recommend that the time of the event be limited to 10 p.m. so that there's time for cleanup uh, before 11 p.m. and taking things down and and moving out of the the street and also that security provided by two police officers um, all the other beer and relevant beer and wine regulations would be observed as, yeah, as I normal. noticed in the her application she was asking for 6 to 11 but the resolution says 7 to 10 that is correct Walter well regarding the times um, are the times different for the street closure versus the alcohol service I believe the street closure is... Do we have them as we want them within the documents that are coming forward? Yeah, the street closure, I believe, is set to 11 p.m. because it's taking into account the need to remove the stage and the garden and all those types of things. Uh, so it generally is going to be a little bit later than the so event it's, it's itself. to 11? I believe that's the case. I'm not 100% sure, but it's... I think they work together and we'll confirm that uh, just to be sure before it gets to council, but um, I'm pretty sure that the alcohol portion is is within and well within the, uh, the street closure which had a broader time frame yeah, I think I had somebody indicated to me that the alcohol was 7 to 10 I, I think that's what the resolution says okay so good afternoon um, yes it, it is um, the alcohol portion of being allowed to sell is from 7 to 10 6 to 7 is allowed for the setup and then from uh, 10 to 11 is the take care now right 
was going to just recall it. Go ahead, Walter. Well, right, I'm glad you came up because my next question is for you. Um, looking at the certificate of liability insurance, okay. it has a policy effective date in the middle of the page of October 14. Th this is just an example. She will, she, she, yeah, this is not the policy. I don't think this, this is one that she did last year. She will have to provide a updated one. Okay. Now it looks like well, that. Goes, she, goes, it looks like she did it. Goes it goes to 15. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it covers like it the, the time It looks like frame. it did, but yeah. it, we'll have to make sure that it has the. It's 13th, 2015. Mm -hmm. It does say that about the date that it was issued, so we'll have to make sure that that's. Right. And the coverage is through the event, uh, through October of this year. So I think we're. I think we're there, but yep, we okay, can yep. confirm. Yeah, we it's it's good for you. Yeah, yeah. It looks fine. It's from 2000, October 2014 so through right. October and 2015. And, and you know, her, desires, her desire has been to do multiple events throughout the course of the summer, so this makes mm -hmm. sense that she put a year period on it. Okay. May I ask the chief a question? Certainly. Do you have any more questions for Rod? I'll be right here. No. <laughs> Chief, I've, I've asked you this, I asked you this question before the last time the council heard this. Um, you don't see any problem with managing your, your side of this, the two police officers, and that they will be paying the city to supply, but in managing this event? This is the May 8th event that was scheduled to go on. I'd like to at least give uh, the applicant an opportunity to see how it would turn out. That's why requesting officers on scene during the Vandal block party, we didn't provide specific officers to that venue. We had five areas to cover that uh, covered seven blocks. So those two officers were pretty busy up and down, but our only problem during that time was boosters and their ability to control alcohol within their extended sidewalk cafe at that point the council authorized but I would like to give the in this chance the applicant to proceed have our officers there to provide a little education and enforcement immediately upon any violations that observed okay the only thing that I would add the uh, vandal block party we just expanded the sidewalk cafe ordinance um, so that they could sell alcohol we didn't have a beer and wine garden this is the first time this is different this, this is different. completely different <clears throat> this will be in a defined enclosed area out in the street out or in next the street, street yeah. but served within the fence yes it has to, and has cannot be brought in has to be served from in the fence and consumed, consumed in, in the fence, fence not taken out of the fence correct okay just like at rendezvous in the park like mm -hmm. at rendezvous the park and we'll have Two officers on scene. Correct. Two officers from 7 to 10. Right. Is the applicant's Which request. Which Boosters is paying for. That is my understanding at this point. Yes, if, that's, if that's Boosters' responsibility that they're going to pay for two officers to be there during the time that alcohol is served. Okay. Right. I feel okay with having the police there on site for education and keeping things with a lid on is what makes this a go for me encourages downtown utilization access to the ordinance that we previously passed and I think we've got the bases covered um, one of the things just occurred to me the 10 p.m. I believe that was the time in a previous either ordinance or resolution that we did regarding the event it ended at 10 well and noise ordinance and it, too. And it had to do with the noise yes. I think was what our concern was is if alcohol goes till 10, when does the band stop? The, the music will stop at 10, too. Now, the music can go on at 10 as long as it doesn't violate the noise ordinance. But it can go beyond 10? Go beyond 10. But, but the street closure is at 11, so they have to have, it they have, to have time to get everything. And then they'll have to down. turn it down quite a bit because the noise ordinance, the Correct. Amount, the, how loud something can be, actually changes drastically at 10 o'clock. Right. Did we, did we, the council pass something in the last few months that defined 10 o'clock as the end time for well, this we, type of thing, or am I, am I confused? It's several years ago, I think, when you did the noise ordinance. No, this was that. much more recent. No, the, I, had a, I had a downtown uh, uh, resident raise the question to me, and I said, we did it for 10 o'clock. There was a little bit of noise ordinance consideration given to the food carts. Is that where it was? Was it in that? Yep. Okay. 
Oh, well, trucks, not cars. Yeah, trucks, cars. Yeah, trucks. Yeah, trucks. We'll right. give it, we talked about that. Yeah. We'll give it a shot and see how she works. Yeah, we'll put it on the regular agenda because it's a resolution. Right. And um, we'll let the rest of the council talk about it also. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And let's see, Rod's still with us. We have a proposed records management. Uh, that's electronic records. Ordinance change or what? What do we got? I'm brand new. Brand new. Uh, good afternoon again. Um, today I'm here before with a proposed ordinance for electronic records management. Basically, it would be adding a new Chapter 10 to Moscow City Code Title I. Um, just a little preface. Government's written work is becoming more and more digitized. Um, computers and digital records are important communications tools in conducting private business and also in doing the um, public's business. Most government agencies use some form of digital um, format to transfer official documents, for example, to send external correspondences like email. A lot of documents are now transferred electronically. Um, city staff are in the process of updating and implementing a new citywide records management system to help expedite government business communications. This will help reduce and perhaps eliminate a lot of paperwork. The overall goal is to move more city records online for more efficient access and storage. In order to be able to do that, we have to have some assurances that the users will be able to access the documents and to be able to produce and reproduce printed documents so that if we store an original in electronically, when we print it and say that it's official and do a certified copy, that will act as an official um, certified copy. Um, we also need to ensure that we can prevent the destruction and corruption of the electronic data. Idaho Code allows cities to use digitized records for official public business as long as safeguards are put in place to make sure records are not destroyed or lost and the public has the ability to access those public records. The authority for cities to utilize the electronic records are found under Idaho Code 50-908, which designates the powers and responsibilities of municipal records management to the city clerk. Idaho Code 50-909 deals with the retention of city records using photographic or digital media, which we are incorporating to the proposed ordinance. That means if we're going to store electronic data and keep it that way, there are certain minimum requirements that the city has to meet in order to do that. So whatever system we implement has to be able to retain the documents in a certain, I don't know, pixel amount, and then the photograph stuff has to be um, per the federal requirements. And we're actually going up a little bit higher. Stephanie was looking into this, and she wants to make sure that our records are um, impeccable. Um, also in this proposed ordinance, emails are specifically addressed stating that they will be retained for two years and then will automatically be removed from the city's exchange server. Unless it has been determined to be a record that we need to keep longer, then we'll have a process to store them and retain such records as required by law. So this proposed ordinance before you um, to go forward to this city council is in pursuant to state code will allow the city to move forward into the 21st century for electronic records and the management of those records. Mark? So this concerns strictly the public records that the city produces and has is completely separate from other records Not associated with personnel and uh, other issues along those lines? Well, it actually allows to use electronic um, data in everything, storage and retention in all city business. Um, personnel stuff will not be um, readily accessible to the public. No, most of those are protected and are exempt from public disclosure. This ordinance is actually just giving us the authority to use the technology in city business. With all of the appropriate assurances for firewalls, security, everything else we can manage to prevent Hacking. Hacking, to the extent that we can, yes. You did, the public won't actually have access directly to these files. Some will, some we will put out there. Um, and so instead of having to do a public records request, when we release stuff onto the um, internet on our website, they will be able to access some of this and we'll be able to use it more and more. And you mentioned public records request. Is this going to make it easier if somebody does make one? for us to be able to access the files they're looking for. Well, yeah, and we're going to be able to know where they are. Through this whole process, we're inventorying every department to kind of know what records that we have, what we have to keep, and then which ones we can destroy, how long we have to keep them. And this process that we're going through, um, if it's authorized, 
um, under this ordinance will help should make things <coughs> a lot better. So the cost of this is coming out in this in the new year's budget. I, I believe so. A lot of the um, the program. Okay. Do you have anything, Walter? Um, just a clarification. The uh, section ten one defines city records as about everything. I'm not going to see and read it. Yep. And then 10.2 declares that they're public property. And then you go on into policies and records responsibilities and so forth. Although this is, is titled to us as an electronic records ordinance, it appears to also cover other types of records. I presume in city code at this moment, there's already ordinances regarding city records. No, we don't have we don't. No. We have process and responsibilities. That's what this is for. Oh, okay. So, so there's no, it's, it's not that we're replacing or overlaying or conflicting with because there is nothing previously in City code. No, but under state code, there are requirements for the city to protect um, records. And what we're saying on the saying that they're public property is that an individual uh, department head or something who crafts a document who thinks they may have a property interest in it, it they do not. It is the, actually the city's document. Okay. So when it comes down to it, um, I assume this also encompasses things like appropriate off-site backups, et cetera, et cetera, so we don't lose... Yes, yeah, so that, then that part of that is in the process will be as we take records, getting ready to destroy some, some we have to keep, but we'll, old records will be able to pull out of people's offices and store it off-site, and it actually should free up workspace for people. Okay, I'm good. All right, we'll move it forward to the regular agenda with a recommendation for approval. Yes. Thank you. Okay, well, that was the last regular item we have. We have one uh, report. That's our 2014 greenhouse gas report. That's going to be presented to us by Keegan Caldwell. Oh, I think we have a video slide. Something. We have a show. A show. Well, then, let the show go on. Like Alice's restaurants, colored glossy photographs. Thank you. Follow along, huh? Um, probably not too closely along with the document itself because I'll jump around a bit, but uh, I guess more for your information. Um, so, this is the update of the state of the greenhouse gas inventory um, and kind of an explanation of the precise, like the the next subsequent documents to the baseline inventory, um, which is the 2012 and then 2014 greenhouse gas inventory benchmark. You have the 2014 benchmark. There's still some details that are being uh, cleaned up on the 2012 benchmark, both of which will be available online um, under the sustainability page of the website to the public. So getting into it, maybe helps to turn on the clicker. We're going to go over a little bit of the methodologies of the inventory process, um, and then we're going to go over a comparison of the baseline to the benchmarks, and then discuss some of the trends. So just a, a quick reminder, um, there are a few steps in creating an inventory. The first one is to choose your year. Uh, we have three years that have been conducted so far the 2008 baseline, the 2012 benchmark, and the 2014 benchmark, and they'll continue to be produced um, biennially uh, after this, so 2016, 2018, and so forth. Uh, the next step is to collect your data. So ICLEI, which is the organization that we're working with on this project, suggests that you stratify your report in a few different levels. The first one is a scope, and then the second one is sectors. The scope basically is a generalization of where you're collecting your data from. Uh, is it purchased inventory information 
such as like purchase utilities from Avista or things like that? Is it owned, such as our vehicle fleet, or is it um, extra, something like the employee commute? Um, the next level down is the sector level, which is there's six categories um, that influence the inventory. And those are how we analyze our inventory because it's more specific than the scope level. Um, to collect information for that, we get a Vista bills, fleet information from the streets department, employee commute surveys, waste audits. All of that is then collected and stratified into our spreadsheet system. Uh, in the last year, we've updated the spreadsheets to involve some checkpoints to ensure that data is entered correctly along the way. Um, that information is then updated to ICLEI, and then ICLEI converts that through their software from bill numbers, um, usage numbers from like kilowatts and natural gas therms um, or gallons used in the vehicle fleet to the CO2 produced or the equivalent CO2 produced by those usages. And then that num those numbers are used to write the reports. And so those numbers are collected, put in, and interpreted. And then those imp interpretations are used to make recommendations and policies for future advancement of the um, efforts made by the city. So here's a quick look at all three years together. Um, these are CO2E, which is carbon dioxide um, equivalent metric tons. Um, so in 2008, we produced 4,456 metric tons of CO2E. Um, by 2014, we were up to 4,505 uh, with a spike in 2012. And then we'll go over that on an in individual sector basis. So the first one is the vehicle fleet. Vehicle fleet information, again, is collected from the streets department uh, based on diesel and gasoline usage by all the vehicles and utilities in the city. Uh, in 2008, we had a 564.4 metric ton usage, uh, increased to 470, well, decreased, net decrease from 2008, um, but an increase from 2012. And that's generally... Um, expected because of, of growth. You see that first initial decrease because of the success of the EcoDriver program, um, which is geared to educate our employees on smart transit. Uh, the next one is the employee commute comparison, which is basically just the commute employee commute data um, collected from surveys distributed in 2013, asking employees how far they drive to work, what sort of vehicle they drive to work. Um, that information from the surveys is then uh, used to update for the entire employee. Um, so in 2013, or sorry, 20, 2008, there was 135 employees. In 2012, there was 143.8 full-time employees. And in 2014, there was 146.3. And so this data trend is to be expected because the more employees we have, the more um, respective CO2 they would produce. Go ahead. Your ratios aren't the same, though. You've got a, I don't know, I can't do the percentages in my head from the numbers you read off, but that large jump in 2014 is a lot bigger percentage-wise than what I think you were reading off in terms of number of employees, unless everybody we hired additional lived in, in Lewiston or Spokane and drove here every day. Well, in two, from 2008 to 2012, you only have a 5% increase. And then from 2012, to 2014, you have a eight-person increase, and uh, oh, sorry, those are percentages. Um, from 2008 to 2012, you have a 8.8-person increase, and then from 2014 or 2012 to 2014, you have a. Mm, A six person. So yeah, you are correct that the percentage. Uh, that seemed to flow. Yeah. So that inventory data is going to be reflected, or it's going to be affected by the general um, numbers. So there's different factors that get added into the inventories. So in the 2008 inventory, the what? carbon, like the carbon footprint factor of the vehicle fleet, um, or the vehicles driven. So you have to account for the number of people that are um, 
self-driving trucks or well, cars or anything things like that. You count for mileage? You have to account for mileage. And again, these are from 2013 surveys, um, at which point for the suggestion of the next inventory would be that all employees are resurveyed to again have another, a more accurate representation of the growth factor and who is driving cars and who is driving light trucks and, and heavy trucks and things like that. So by the 2014 information, so you're using 2013 information to make generalizations about 2008 and then you're making using 2013 data to make again generalizations about 2014 because of the surveys you only have and this is is in your employee in your um, report so you only had 70 or 82 responses of the 143 employees at the time and so that information has to be assumed for the other the rest of the employees and so the way those numbers work out is what you're seeing here <coughs> is those generalizations based on those numbers. But to calculate all this, you have to identify what kind of vehicle they're driving, what kind of gas mileage that vehicle gets on an individual basis, correct? You have to, basically the way it, it's conducted, you are, you find the percentage of the employees that responded to the surveys that are driving cars or passenger vehicles and then you have to find the percentage of employees that are pr driving trucks and things like that and then you take that same percentage and apply it to the total number of employees so in 2013 <coughs> when this survey was conducted and these are the percentages we're using for all of the benchmarks okay, let me ask you this though you said you identify employees driving trucks mm -hmm. do you identify the types of trucks do you do you no, What's your error factor in all this then? It looks to me like it could be somewhat substantial. Well, ICLE only allows for a identification of three types of vehicles. Either your truck falls into a light truck category or a heavy truck category, okay. which is a usually is based on the weight of your vehicle. Mm -hmm. Right. And so off the top of my head, I can't say what that weight limit is, but mm -hmm. most vans... Um, small SUVs and light trucks, your standard, anything up to an F-350 I think is around your cutoff um, for a size idea is going to fall in that light truck category. So that's the majority of users. And then overlaid on that there's the distance each has to drive. So is there exactly. a disproportionate distribution of trucks and cars from <coughs> Troy or Deary versus Moscow? Somebody, yeah, exactly. Somebody driving a heavy truck from Lewiston is going to have a much higher effect on the overall distribution um, than somebody who's driving a car here in town. Go ahead, Walter. We got 82 responses out of 140-something? We got 82 responses out of 143. Why would we not have 100% response? They work for us. It's our program. Surveys were distributed over a certain amount of time and requested that they were responded to. Um, after that point, the the research can move forward with that. Hopefully, in future years, the survey responses will be at a higher rate. We'll see why we can't get 100% response. I would certainly think that we could get 100% response. Oh, Here comes, comes Jen. comes a lady with the answer. <laughs> Not an answer, just a comment. Um, with the surveys, with getting the 80-some-odd percent or number of employees responding, that actually gives us a very reliable uh, response rate, just as we do with the citizen survey. Once we hit that threshold, it can be applicable to the population as a whole. So. You. Mm -hmm. No, that's all I, I had to share. Just use the low response rate is, is why the data seems funny. So we can't have it both ways. No, we don't have a, we don't have an exact represent, representation of the population as a whole. But the sample that we did get is a reliable enough number that we can generally infer from the population as a whole. We that could change but if we got an entire ago, population. We, when we started with my question about why the huge jump in 2014. I'm sorry, I, we didn't have this stuff before the yeah. meeting, so I'm flying blind here. I'm just it's okay. winging it. There's just, but, I just but was mentioning there's a balance. The was we only got 82 out of 140-something, therefore the data might not be totally reflective of the situation. Jen's answer was it was statistically correct, therefore it is reflective. My question remains, with employees in our program, why can't we get 100% response rate? That's true. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is there is an error rate that we experience with that response rate as well. So there's sure still there's, a balance. It's I'm never sure perfect, but we can infer generally, and I was just sure supporting Keegan's, Keegan's the okay. there, so. Just, just support. Walter's that comment is specifically is 
there are employees and why can't we get 100 percent? He's not really questioning how close the data is or if it's a representation that's correct or not. It's simply why aren't they all responding? Mm -hmm. So that question that we can talk about you for bet. next year. You bet. Thank okay. you. And this, this will have a, we'll get back into the per employee basis by the end of the presentation as well, in the, in the trend section of the presentation. So moving on to the next sector, we have our buildings and facilities comparison. Um, we have 2008, 745 uh, metric tons, 838, and then back down to 764. Um, what you're seeing here is we were kind of analyzing a bit of a high and low trend between 2008 and 2012. Um, and those are things that are affected by weather, by facility and management, number of people, moving offices, um, moving departments into different offices. We also brought online new facilities in 2012, and then by 2014, we'd made changes to other facilities to overcome that, um, big ones being like lowering the natural gas usage to add to the pool. There was a significant decrease in, from 2012 to 2014 of the natural gas used at the pool. Um, there was again another big increase or decrease in energy used um, at the police station between those two years. So you're seeing an overcoming of the rise between 2008 and 2012 of bringing on new facilities to a better management. And I suspect that will only get better as we implement new behavioral changes to employees at their workstations, um, make renovations to facilities, upgrades, or there are discussions of new upgrades to the HERC lighting, um, HVAC systems and other facilities, things like that will all continue to change this. Um, and again, you'll, we will still have to overcome the growth factor of more employees working in more workstations. Wastewater and facility treatment. Um, basically what you're seeing here is the accumulation of water treated versus the amount of energy um, charged to us by Avista. Um, and that energy or that water, water that is treated is reflectant of not just the city water that's treated, so not water that is flushed down toilets or sinks in city facilities. That's the city as a whole. Um, there's no way to differentiate how much water is being treated per facility versus by residents in, in the town. So this is um, entire city. the entire city, whereas everything else is city-owned. Well, that would be appropriate because it's, it's our facility yeah. that's treating it, so that's what we're concerned about. So in between 2008 and 2012, oh, the other thing is that this is also water pumped at our city well, so this is, and water pumped and water treated. And in 2008, we had a very low pumping year, and in 2012, we had a very high pumping year. And so 2014, you're seeing a stabilization between the two numbers, which is something we should see in subsequent data. That should be proven in years to come. But after discussions with the water department, over a 10-year period, it is we, we can clearly see that 2008 and 2012 were anomaly years for pumping, which is unfortunate for the benchmarks because it shows kind of funky data, but that's what you're seeing. Streetlight traffic signal comparisons, you see a decrease from 2008 to 2012 because of the LED uplight, uh, updating that went on. You see an increase from 2012 to 2014 because we brought on extra bus stops with more lights. More lights were added to parks um, and parking lots and things like that. Solar power, baby. Sorry, Kate. Solar power. All right. Well. Not, not all of them. But <laughs> a bunch of them are solar powered. Your crosswalks and things across are around town that now have flashing signals on them as well, those are added signals to that. <coughs> so we have more lights. And then the final one is the solid waste comparison. Solid waste is just based on, based on the total yardage the, or the total volume of the trash bins at our facilities. They're, we don't measure exactly how much our trash is weighed, nor do we have a accurate representation of what's of being Moscow thrown away. Only, this is only city of Moscow facilities. Not the city, but the city of Moscow trash. No, this is the city as city an organization. Moscow. No, okay. city of Moscow. Okay. Yes, entity, this is ours. The entity city of Moscow. Everything, everything in this report is representative of the entity of the city of Moscow minus this, the water and the wastewater treatment because you can't differentiate what is the city's and what's the city of Moscow's. Right. So this is an assumption based on the idea that every bin is full to the brim every time that it's come to pick up. 
You're seeing 75 metric tons. That's why it hasn't changed. The yardage or the volume of our trash bins at all of our facilities hasn't changed since 2008. Um, if we get bigger receptacles, that's going to go up. If we get smaller receptacles, it'll go down. So our trends, um, overall, again, you're seeing this kind of variation, an increase by 2012 and a decrease by 2014. Um, 2008 to 2012, the wastewater and water treatment differential of small pumping year versus large pumping year <coughs> and efficiency increases in building and facilities is why you're seeing these differences. But we came up with a question. So you see this net increase between 2014 and 20, 2008. We came up with a question of why can't the city overcome growth or does the inventory account for growth? Uh, and how are we ever going to meet our goals or are our goals applicable when you don't account for growth? And so we decided to take a different look at the data and incorporate per employee usage. We actually see a net trend of a decrease from 2008 to 2014. So in 2008, there was that 33.01 employees, 32.21. Um, oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong numbers. 135 employees in 2008. 143 in 2012 and 146 in 2014. After you do the math and separate out the total percentage, um, we have 33 metric tons in 2008 were produced per employee, 32.2 in 2012, and then 30.79, which is a 7% decrease from 2008 to 2014, which is good. It means our, act our inventory and our efforts are actually going down from our baseline. Um, so this is the new way that will be evaluated in subsequent reports is our em pro employee so that way we can overcome the fact that the city is going to grow as we would hope it would. Go ahead. <coughs> However, the council adopted goal is to reduce the city as an entity by 20%. To re You're correct. The goal so is... The goal from this one report sounds to be unachievable. Do, does the council need to redefine its goal? The council might want to redefine where its starting point was because or, or if, something. as Keegan says, 2008 was a very low year for a lot of water pumping and other issues, and so it might be an artificially low beginning point that we might never be able to get 20% less of. I, I think you can look at the, if you look at just where it is in total production, which is this graph, this first one, and see that 2014 is in between 2008 and 2012, you can make the inference that 2014 is accurate of other years that are not anomaly years due to water pumping and things like that. But as we have really hot summers and low snowfall in the winters, our water levels and our well levels and all that can change dramatically. And so I think those are things that we can't necessarily change, continue changing the baseline. Um, and the reason why we changed the baseline the first time from the 2005 data to the 2008 data was so that we would have similar methodologies for all future reports. That was the biggest, biggest reason why we made that change, so that everything from there on out would be apples to apples. I think what we see here is encouraging. It does not seem to be the case. Huh? No, this, I think this very much is so because before we hadn't made the uh, connection to account for employee, uh, employee growth. So more employees means more energy used, more water used, more employees driving to work and commuting, and more vehicles on the road that the city is putting them in. Parks Department gets bigger, brings on three more vehicles, that's three more vehicles to the inventory. That was never accounted for. It also doesn't quite take into account that we have very few data points here so far. We've got three data points, and I feel uncomfortable assigning too much to three data points. Also, 12 and 14. here's a methodology question. Does the ICLEI software allow for virtuous energy use, for example, recycling? That should provide sort of a negative to the whole issue it, with the more you recycle. Crisis. Yes, I am. So well, and I've had that discussion with our equity representative. Currently, the software doesn't reflect if we put solar panels on the roof, 
you know, that much less or that much being given back. And how I would overcome that is in that process before we go into ICLEI, instead of just going straight from bills to ICLEI, we go bills to spreadsheets to ICLEI. And those spreadsheets will allow for some of that adjustment. So what I would take off the top then is say, how much annually energy are we producing from the solar panels? Take that out from the total building and facility electricity usage before it ever went into ICLEI. It should come out in the Avista bill. Yeah, that would come out the Avista bill. Anything about things where you can't quite track it, like if we're recycling lots of plastics and paper and things like that are going back upstream. The, the waste side of this whole inventory is always going to be an area that w is going to be somewhat of an unknown as long as we don't necessarily track the production. And so because it is all on a, a trend based on the idea that all of our bins are filled to the brim and I'm using the generalized um, waste audit that's provided by the landfill that we send all of our waste to. So that's their entire served population's waste audit. Um, and that's the numbers that we have to use because our current waste system in Moscow doesn't reflect the need for a waste characterization. Um, Might that's there more be the or less opportunity specific when we than go to we single have. stream recycling to get a better handle on that? We might be able to get a better idea of what is being averted from our bins um, and make some citywide observations. If we know that what well, we're sending waste to the landfill versus what's being recycled, if that's changed over the years, we might be able to make those inferences on the city data. But Tim Grisbeck says that every waste container is registered as it goes out. Mm -hmm. So ideally that would be something that could be looked into in the future, but I can't say for sure. Well, we should be able to track what the city's recycling because it goes out in bins to Oh, it, it grabs it and it, registers it. And oh, yeah, they don't know how yeah. many tons are recycled and how and many think, tons go to the landfill. Yeah, and so I think that's those are data that can be obtained to provide us a better handle here as well as the potential for your spreadsheet intermediary to provide some credit for doing good that otherwise wouldn't be registering. I still think we're chasing a goal that's unachievable. Well, it just depends on where you started your... Or are you going to take 20% from is that initial starting point, and I'm not sure 2008 is it. We need more data points before we get too carried away, I think. Well, the comment that I've made a couple years past was that when we first started doing this, we made the sensible and we made the easy changes that made the big change. And now it's getting harder and harder significantly each year to what, what can we do to become more efficient. The efficiency ratio starts becoming narrower and narrower. You know, there's some hope that uh, as we go to single stream recycling that there'll be less landfill usage. And so maybe you'll be able to track it from that standpoint, although your recyclables don't weigh very much other than the glass, and the glass we're not, we're not going to recycle. Not recycling. So, well, we are, but we aren't. So no, that's correct. Yeah. It, 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 anyway. What else you got for us? That's about it. Uh, the only thing that I would say is if you're reconsidering policy in the future would be that as opposed to a change of that baseline year again or something like that, it would be a change of the interest from 20% of the total emissions before to now the more educated understanding that we should be tracking things on a per employee basis. So maybe changing that from 20% of the total emissions in 2008 to something more like 10% of the per employee usage of the 2008 levels. Or 15 percent of those. I think that sounds. I think we need to stop adding so many employees. Yeah, I, I kind of like. <laughs> I like that approach. So Absolutely. that could be something that can be considered later on. We can wait until another inventory is created and get a better idea. Then that's something that we can propose. I'm sure, per employee, I think provides a truer picture of what's going on. Yeah. And that's what we're finding. When we actually evaluated on that trend, we found that we are actually decreasing our emissions, which. Would, which is what we should be seeing based on efforts that have already been done. Talk about employees, you're talking about full-time. We're talking about full-time employees, not part-time. Okay, anything else? Thank you. Yeah. Well, if there's nothing else before this, Lesh, we are adjourned. <laughs>